Uh, I'm Chip McGrogan. I started in RCA in 1957 on the graduate study program. I was out of Drexel, graduated class of 57, second in my class. Uh, Drexel, of course, was a co-op school. And it was about the only way I could really get to college. You know, so after five years, I had, you know, five years of education that included two years of practical work experience. The last two years of co-op experience was uh, at Burroughs where I worked with a, as essentially the personal technician of a real transistor expert. And that was before the transistor was widely known. Uh, that experience paid off when I got an, I was looking for a place to go to graduate school. You know, I could take an assistantship and teach and make very little money, but get a master's degree. And then RCA came along with the graduate study program, which was new in 1957. It essentially offered you essentially free tuition and books for two years at the University of Pennsylvania, which was one of my favorite schools. And, uh, and we got paid for essentially 80% of our time. They paid us like a dollar an hour for the time we're in school. But they paid us a regular salary for the rest of the time. And uh, that was after two years, we'd have a master's degree and two more years of work experience. So that really paid off. And that was the deciding factor that brought me to RCA. I interviewed a number of places in RCA, including the uh, they called the Home Instrument Division, which is where these guys were breaking their neck and working all night to develop color TV. I was very impressed by that, but uh, I interviewed in advanced technology labs in Camden, where, which were doing some of the same kind of work I was doing as a co-op, and uh, met uh, several people there. When I was doing co-op work, I picked up a book, the only book that existed on transistor electronics. Turned out the authors were all from RCA. I met some of them during my interview time. Uh, they hired me on the spot. I never had to co-op. I never had to basically rotate to another assignment. They wanted me there. So I spent the first few years of my career working with the, essentially what was the beginning of the transistor age, taking all the old vacuum tube circuits and learning them how to transistorize them write a patent. I think I ended up in the first couple of years with about 13 patents uh, doing that, which I don't think they were ever worth anything, but uh, it looked good on a resume. And I worked in that. I did some work in advanced technology on what was called neural networks, which were simulations of how the brain works with essentially threshold type logic. Right? And I wrote a paper on that submitted it to the National Electronics Conference in, I think, 1960. All right, won first prize for the best paper of the conference. All right, $500 prize, which at that time was like a month's salary. Uh, so that was the beginning of my work in the advanced technology area. But a few years into that, I, uh, the job was awarded to the advanced technology labs, which was a product development thing, which was strange but it seemed to be the way the government wanted to do business. It was to develop a secure IFF, Identification Friend or Foe System, that uh, turned out to be the first application of integrated circuits. Now, integrated circuits in those days were a T05 can with two gates or a flip-flop or something like that. That was, that, but that was radical at the time. I mean, before then, everything was discrete devices. Right, and uh, it was in the, what they called the InfoSec area, it was called ComSec at the time, communication security, right, and that was a black art. There was no textbooks, there was no college courses, there was no courses that you could attend or seminars that you could attend to learn that. Everything was self-taught. Customers would come in, tell us what they wanted, tell us how to do it, We'd ask questions, we'd have very interesting, lively exchanges with them, and then we taught each other. It was part of the, that family spirit. We didn't know anything, 
But what we did know, we passed on to our co-workers to make them just as active. We needed experts, and the only way we could find them was not to go out and hire them. We had to create them within our own organization. That bonded us as a team. Uh, that information, the, the I, IFF system, later had another spin-off project, which was a combat net radio security device, right? The KY-38, which was at the time the essential communications device of the Vietnam War. Um, that's where I met Eddie Mosey, who was running that project. We were using the same technology, sharing the same team members, sharing our knowledge with each other, co-developing essentially similar but different functionality products. Uh, that started my career in Infosec. That was 1964. I remember that year very well because I think that's the year the Phillies were 13 games ahead going into September and then lost the pennant. <laughs> I don't think any of us will ever, rem any, uh, any of us local never. Philadelphia people will never forget that year. Nor or Gene Malk, who was the manager at the time. But that was the year I started in the InfoSec area and that basically was almost the rest of my career. It, that evolved into other projects that were similar in, in the 19, late 1970s, 1980, we won an award for, a, for the TriTech communication system, which involved several devices. One was a, a secure telephone called the DSVT. I, you know, I saw one in the case coming in today out in the lobby. You know, a field telephone that was secure. Uh, there was a teletype crypto device built from the same technology, and this was a little bit more of an integrated circuit than the, the ones we had in the, in the earlier equipments. This was basically a custom chip that we designed, not, not complex by today's standards, but very advanced at the time. We were developing the technology to, to design and develop these chips at the same time we were building them. So it was not waiting for something to be developed and then use it. It was developing your tools at the same time you're developing the products. Um, the KG84 was a teletype encryptor at that time, using first real product using integrated circuits. They were CMOS, which is still the technology of choice today, even though it, the geometry is slightly smaller now by orders of magnitude. Um, that teletype encryptor replaced a device called the, the, I think it was the KW7, which had a reputation as the only teletype encryptor in the, in the military, but it had a mean time between failure of about three or four days. So uh, they needed something to replace it. The KG84 was that device. We developed a, a prototype that they called an E-model. Uh, of that, we lent several of them out to the military to try out. They loved it. They said it worked beautifully. It didn't. Uh, their only complaint was from their maintainability people who could not test their maintainability concepts because the damn thing never failed. So uh, we took that as a compliment, but uh, they didn't. So, but uh, that was the beginning of Secure Voice. Now Secure Voice ran into several other pro products since then. Um, one of them was the STU-3, which was the first time we were really developing and working with other contractors to develop a similar project, similar product. We had three companies essentially developing the same product. So we were not competing on the on the contract to develop it, but we would be competing on the sale of the product. The other product companies were Motorola and AT&T. Now, I think John Rittenhouse was our vice president at the time, and he said, how can you compete with a phone company? Well, the, the two ComSec contractors, uh, RCA and Motorola, skunked AT&T. <laughs> we built the best product, lowest price, 
right? And AT and T was playing catch up the whole time. They they had they didn't have this spirit of the Comsec community where you cooperated during the development, even though you were competitors. It's something we learned the hard way. You know, it worked, it's in everybody's interest. If you cooperate in design, developing the specs and things, well, AT&T, a commercial company, always played things close to the vest. They never socialized with us during the meetings we had together. Well, the other guys just knew each other like brothers. That went back even to TriTac days uh, where we were not developing competing products, but we were developing things that had to interoperate with our products. And, you know, but, uh, but it was a, a spirit and a, an area that I think the ComSec community was, was unique to them. That you, you had people, competing companies, working together in the common interest. And it paid off for everybody. We learned that and it paid off. The Stu 3 sold hundreds of thousands of them. It was at a time when the Cold War was at its peak. There were communication towers that, that were in major cities that were being uh, read in real time by Soviet uh, intelligence operations and we needed to secure our communications. And the, the Stu 3 was the answer at that time. You, the predecessor equipment was the KY3, which was like a couple of steamer trunks worth of equipment. Uh, I remember when, I think when Reagan was shot, they showed him going into the hospital, followed by the two gurneys of carrying these big cases of equipment. And you could see on the lettering on it, it said, KY3. That was the communication, secure communications device prior to this 2 3. So uh, that was the beginning. It was the first really, at that time, we were trying to develop a product that required digital signal processors, where at the same time digital signal processors were being developed. So we were the guinea pig for that. We had to build voice encoders, modems, all digital, using products that were being developed at the same time that we were trying to use them. It took a while, but we, we succeeded, developed the, essentially the, one of the best uh, two-wire echo-canceling modems that ever existed in this world. Uh, we had experience where people would take them into remote outposts and things, embassies and backwater countries, and they said, good luck with your, with your secure modem there because we can't even get a, a, a fax machine to work here. And they said it worked fine. It really compensated for, the, for the, the, all the oddball things that the communication system could do. It could live with them. Right? And that was uh, one of our great successes. That led to other products, which like the uh, this called secure telephone equipment, which was an ISDN secure telephone. Again, it was more advanced and, and things, used newer technology, but basically did the same function. As a matter of fact, they built a Stu3 compatible mode into it because they had so many Stu3s out there, they still had to talk to them and they couldn't replace them all. So that was the whole history of that. Again, we were working with other companies, very similar to same ones we had worked with before, cooperating on a common specification that would work together. They had to interoperate. Right, and uh, you know, we just had that community spirit, not only within ourselves, but within the community of interest, which was small, but uh, very significant. Uh, the process of doing this work was still black art, no textbooks, you know, no published papers to go on. 
uh, the modems and things and the voice coders were pretty much open technology, but the security aspects were still a black art. Mm -hmm. I worked with the customers, learned from the customers. Yeah, now you uh, were in a kind of a unique position. You have basically become essentially a national asset. You're, you're the person who taught the other people as we came through the whole ComSec area. That was really part of the joy of doing it is taking somebody raw to the business, teaching them to do it. We had some of the most rigorous design reviews you ever saw. They were really bloody. But nobody, it wasn't vicious, it was educational. Mm -hmm. People learned, you know, and we taught them. And then they taught others, you know, and it was, you know, it was a close-knit group of people. They, uh, we had our fights internally, but nothing vicious. It was all friendly thing, you know, things that you wouldn't do today. We'd make ethnic jokes to other people on our team, but today in this day in the world, that's, that's not even allowed or permitted, but it was friendly, mm -hmm. you know, and nobody took it seriously, and uh, it was a, it was a, form of bonding and friendship. As you were a younger engineer, did you feel like you had any mentors? A lot of the mentoring <clears throat> came from the customer, mm -hmm. right? You know, there was no real technical expertise to draw on, but there was some good management and marketing expertise we had. We got a lot of the business sole source because of the personal relationships that were formed between our team and the customer's team. Mm -hmm. And you were in the forefront of that. Yeah, well, you know, we went with them, right? We'd go to a meeting, marketing guy would take us, he would get us in the door, we'd sit down with our counterparts and work out things, and they liked us because they didn't really know what they want and we didn't know what they want, and it evolved over the course of the program. But there was none of this, uh, let's rewrite the contract every time they wanted to change something. Mm -hmm. It was, we're working together to solve the same problem, right? And let's work it together. You help us with our problems, we'll help you with yours, right? There was no uh, you know, lawyer sitting in the way of impeding progress. It was, uh, mm -hmm. it was good natured, uh, let's work for a team. We're a team with the customer, we're a team with our, even with our competitors. We're, we're all working the same problem and it's, a, and it's in our common interest to solve the problem. And you had some significant competitors. Oh yeah. How do you feel the customer looked at RCA? I think they liked us. We got a lot of sole source awards or at least two source or three source awards, mm -hmm. right? We didn't have to go run out and compete with upstarts. As a matter of fact, it was hard for an upstart to get into this business because of the of the lure and the culture of not only working with this customer, but the technology itself was essentially hush hush. You know, wasn't published. Mm -hmm. We taught each other, we taught our coworkers, and they learned from it, and they. And they, then they became the mentors to the next generation. Uh, and what about your supervisors? They never got in our way, that's <laughs> all I can say. I eventually became one of them for a while, but then I, I didn't really like that aspect of the job and mm -hmm. went back and became a staff engineer. And so you're saying they just let you do your work? As long as they were happy. They, I mean, I had some tough Supervisors. I think you heard Charlie Schmidt's mention name, but uh, had a lot of people he hated and he was hated, but I got along with him fine because he, he let me do my job. If I disagreed with him, he accepted me, my opinion, rather than his own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Charlie had a reputation for, as a very demanding person, but the people who produced Oh, yeah. Always seemed to like him. Oh yeah, and he threw some of the best Christmas parties ever. <laughs> I won't ask him how he financed them because it might not be legal. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, 
but there was a lot of uh, trips to Somerville <laughs> that, that paid for our Christmas parties that nobody remembers ever going on. Um, so you've been through the some very significant um, projects, basically yeah. as a trailblazer. Yeah. Um, how do you think RCA valued you as a part of this? Well, they let me keep working after I retired, so uh, I, I think I retired the first time when the uh, Lockheed Martin took over, and I was 62 at the time, so I could cash out my old RCA lump sum and uh, keep working, go back to work the next day. Mm -hmm. With another company, worked there three more years till I was 65 and retired again, and then worked as a uh, as essentially a full-time consultant for a few more years. And I think that and I really worked in. I, I kind of phased into retirement gradually, which is probably the best thing. I phased my way from full-time to part-time to just call me when you need me, sort of thing. Right, and that was that went on until about two years ago when I decided uh, I've had enough and uh, stopped coming into work. Mm -hmm. But that was retirement. It wasn't sudden. It was gradual. And enjoyed every minute of it. Now, as an observer of what we used to call refer to you people as the cryptographers, um, there were some. Rather unusual people in your group. Did you notice that? I was probably one of them. <laughs> I, I didn't think of them as unusual, but uh, but everybody had their own personality, and everybody accepted the way everybody else was, and we could insult each other to to we turn blue in the face and and get together and work on solving a common problem the next day. Mm -hmm. It was just part of the, the team spirit. Okay. What would you say was the best thing about working for RCA? I, I think it was the fact that we wanted to be the best and we tried to be the best. Sometimes we succeeded, not always, but, uh, but, uh, but it was always a team effort. Everybody contributed, everybody got credit. You've heard some other people talk about the transitions from RCA into GE into Martin Marietta. How did that affect you? Well, I I think there was an era there where they I think they called like harvesting the seeds that we planted, right? And that went on for a while, and it, it didn't really result in any growth. Right, and then all of a sudden we kind of found out what we were doing right in the beginning and went back to it, won some new opportunities. Mm -hmm. I, the, my age 65 retirement was September of 1999. I retired on the day we submitted a proposal for something called Axe that I had worked, I had worked on that proposal. I was retired and taking a, a long vacation. I was over in Spain with my wife and we got a call that, hey, we won that program. <laughs> right? That program went on, it started out, I think, as maybe a hundred million and it went on to hundreds of millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Right? And I remember doing consulting by phone when I was away and uh, working on it when I was here and uh, it was one of the classic type programs that was our roots. Mm -hmm. It was a replacement for the Millstar system mm -hmm. with secure communications basically for Millstar. Mm -hmm. But it was it was one of the type programs that we had done before and did better than anybody else and and I think the customer loved it and Um, I asked what was the best part about working for RCA. What was the worst part about working for RCA? Well, I guess the, the Camden environment was never impressive. It, it didn't bother me, but it made it hard to get other people to come. We tried to hire somebody and they'd have to drive through Camden to get here. And 
and they say no thanks. Mm -hmm. But it never bothered me. I mean, I I just got used to it. I guess developed a thick skin. Do you have any opinions on the assertion that RCA may have actually changed South Jersey? I think it was South Jersey when I come up. I mean, it was. I mean, nowhere you went, it was RCA. You go to a gas station, to sign a credit card receipt, they'd hand you an RCA pen. You know. <laughs> You know, it was it was everywhere. Everybody either had knew somebody or had a family member. Mm -hmm. I mean, at one time I worked with third generation RCA employees. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody whose grandfather started there during World War II, and their children were there, and they were the third generation, and all working in RCA. It was a way of life. Um. So how would you sum up your career? Evidently, it was more than just a job. Oh yeah, it was something I, I, I couldn't, it was hard to retire actually. Mm -hmm. But, you know, eventually just got, got old enough that I, I like to sleep late in the morning. But, uh, but when I was working, I had thought nothing about uh, getting up at coming in before 7 o'clock in the morning and going home after 6 o'clock at night because I enjoyed every minute of it. Mm -hmm. It was getting something done that was useful, enjoyable, and working with other people that I enjoyed. And mm -hmm. Well, Chip, um, I appreciate you coming in to do this. Um, and let me just say, um, as just having been around here and having followed your career, uh, you retired and then were asked to come back several times because they really felt you had knowledge that they simply couldn't do without. You are genuinely one of the few national assets that, uh, that we can talk about. And uh, I, you know, what you have done with RCA is um, is just phenomenal. So I appreciate you coming in. Well, you know, part of it was uh, I go back to my training, and I when I was in high school, somehow if you were in the first track of the high school I went to, you were in the first track of everything. So if I was good in science and math, I also got into the first track with English and literature and everything else. So I. In spite of the fact that there were a lot of people who were better writers than I were in high school, when I got to college and work, I was the best writer among the people because I, because of my training. And communications was a, was a skill that very few engineers had, mm -hmm. right? Which I had somehow managed to own, right? And teach. I mean, I had one coworker who will tell me to this day that I told him to write in English. <laughs> He was, a, you know, he was from South America originally, in Poland and then South America, and, uh, and then grew up in Brooklyn and never really learned to write clearly. And he would give me something he had written, right, and I'd bleed to death on it with red ink and give it back to him, and he, next time it would be a lot better, right. And uh, it was... Uh, Communication skills are as important as engineering skills or logic skills or, or anything else. And writing winning proposals was as much a part of the business as, as mm -hmm. performing on the job. Mm -hmm. Well, we won't mention his name, but I can tell you that he did recognize you as one of his teachers. Yeah. So I think he actually appreciated it. Actually, he ended up writing, being a co-writer on a book. <laughs> so that's how far he came. So I feel good about the, some of the people I mentored who are now the leaders in this business. And yes.